My name is Michael Lind. Uh, on behalf of New America, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, very special occasion uh, in many ways. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, the author of Political Order and Political Decay from the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy, uh, is one of those rare figures who needs no introduction. Uh, uh, he's probably the most famous, if not one of the most famous uh, public intellectuals of his generation uh, in the United States and in the world. Uh, he introduced the phrase, the end of history, uh, in a uh, uh, famous 1989 national interest uh, quarterly uh, magazine, later expanded into a, a book, The End of History and the Last Man, which occasioned a global controversy. Uh, since then, he's uh, written a series of uh, very well-received and uh, uh, equally controversial uh, books, including Trust, The Social Virtues and the Creation of Prosperity, the Great Disruption, Human Nature and the Reconstitution of Social Order, Our Post-Human Future, State Building, America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power, and the Neoconservative Legacy, and the first volume of a two-volume series of which the, the present book, Political Order and Political Decay, uh, is the culmination. Uh, the earlier book is The Origins of Political Order from Pre-Human Times to the French Revolution. Uh, uh, and Professor Fukuyama teaches now at Stanford, having taught at Johns Hopkins and at a George Mason University. Uh, so it's a great honor uh, being able to host him today uh, for this uh, very important work. Uh, and it's a personal pleasure as well. I've known Frank, uh, I think, for a quarter of a century now. Uh, and he was a founding board member of the New America Foundation. So that uh, uh, what, what is good in New America uh, <laughs> can you know, be attributed partly to Frank's influence. And we'll take uh, credit for, uh, for the rest. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Frank Fukuyama. Oh, thanks, Michael. Well, let's begin, Frank, by uh, uh, my asking you about the arc of the two book series. So the first book uh, really s literally starts in the Pleistocene era in, in the Ice Age and then brings... It's actually before that. It starts uh, with monkeys. So. <laughs> okay, the pre-human era. Uh, and brings us up through agrarian uh, civilizations. And then this book shows what happens to political systems in different regions of the world uh, as a result of industrialization and the incorporation of, of middle classes. Well, uh, the larger structure of the book uh, is to talk about the evolution of politics. Um, there is a tendency on the part of a lot of people to not believe in progress or modernization. Uh, and you know, one of the purposes, I think, of the two volumes is to describe what that means uh, for, for politics. And so it turns out that despite the cultural diversity that exists uh, and has existed throughout human history, there's also what the anthropologists would call a process of general evolution in which disparate societies come up with similar kinds of solutions to solve problems of social order. So 40,000 years ago, everybody is running around on the savanna in Africa in a band level society of 40, 50 people, all genetic relatives of one another. The first major transition that happens is the discovery of tribalism, which begins about 10,000 years ago, in which you have a belief in, in the power of dead ancestors and unborn descendants to affect life in this world. And uh, all of a sudden, patrilineal, uh, few matrilineal societies appear in India, China, uh, among the Germanic barbarians that were the predecessors of Europeans, uh, you know, all over the world, uh, succeeded by state-level societies, uh, maybe seven, eight thousand years ago. Uh, and um, then the other institutions that we come to understand, you know, like rule of law and like democracy, uh, gradually get added. So I think there's actually a coherent evolutionary story uh, to be told about uh, about global politics. Uh, the thing that I, in, in the title of this book, the, uh, the political decay part is something that I did not write about uh, in, uh, in previous uh, books, but I think it's also a permanent feature of human societies that any uh, political order that seeks to be modern, meaning uh, impersonal, uh, based on a concept of broad public interest is subject to political decay uh, for a couple of reasons, and one has to do with intellectual rigidity, that you create an institution to meet a certain set of conditions. It solves a problem of human cooperation under certain conditions, but then uh, 
human beings like to worship their institutions, whether it's the Japanese emperor, the British monarchy, or the US Constitution. And then when those are not appropriate, they, they fail to adjust. Uh, and the other has to do with the capture of institutions by, by insiders. And this, in volume one, I traced you know, in ancient China, uh, in the, um, the case of the Ottomans, where they had d uh, devised this incredibly <laughs> unusual system for getting beyond tribalism. Uh, the, they basically would capture uh, white European children uh, in the Balkans and bring them back to Istanbul and then train them to be administrators, generals, vizirs, uh, and so forth, uh, because that was the only way that you could break the tribalism in, in you know, the Middle East. Uh, and that system began to break down when the Janissaries and, and the other, these other slave soldiers began to have children uh, and started to you know, <laughs> want to give their children benefits you know, from their <coughs> political position and so forth. The uh, French uh, Empire uh, or the French uh, monarchy did the same thing prior to the revolution in terms of selling uh, officers, uh, offices, public offices to what were called venal office holders. And so there's also, I think, a permanent tendency towards uh, political decay, uh, which uh, then leads to the need for renovation of political systems. Well, you talk about modernity in terms of impartiality or of impersonality. Uh, and two of the terms that are very important in your book are clientelism and uh, patrimonialism, which represent uh, sort of the other extreme. Uh, could you, mm -hmm. you expand on, on those terms? Well, maybe it would help to back up a little bit. So in, in my framework uh, that I laid out in the first volume, uh, I think that there are three important sets of institutions that constitute a political order today. So one has to do with the state, and the state is all about power. It's the ability to concentrate power, use it to enforce laws, to deliver services, to protect the population. Uh, and then there are two institutions that constrain power. First of those is the rule of law, which is a set of rules that, if it's to be truly the rule of law, have to apply to the most powerful uh, people in the, in the polity, the king or the president or the prime minister. And the second is the institutions of democracy that are meant to force the government to respond to the wishes of the whole population rather than simply to uh, their own uh, self-interest. In my view, the hardest transition to make, uh, the, well, the easiest one actually is democracy. Uh, because today we actually can set up elections and, and select leaders by popular vote relatively easily. And that's happened in many, many countries. There's about 110 to 115 electoral democracies now uh, in the world. The much, much, much harder transition is to get from what Max Weber called the patrimonial state to a modern state. So a patrimonial state is a state where the elite running the country think of the state as basically their piggy bank. It's their patrimony. Uh, and the reason they're in politics is to get personal benefits out of their political position. In the days when there actually were monarchs, you know, that was legal because <laughs> you know, the, the king actually literally owned the, the, the lands and could give it to his children uh, and so forth. Today, we all pretend to be running modern impersonal states, but in fact, the reality in many countries is that the people running the government want to use the government as a, as a means of getting rich or, or see it as, as part of their patrimony. And the big struggle, I think, is to get to a modern state, which is an impersonal one, where your relationship to the government does not depend on your personal connection to the ruler or the ruling elite. It simply depends on your status as citizen. And a modern state is also one where there's a very clear dividing line between public interest and personal interest. And uh, you know, in a, in a patrimonial state, there's no such thing as corruption because the king owns everything. Uh, but in a modern state, there's supposed to be this division. And this, I would say, is really the central struggle in our politics that in a way is more important than the struggle between de democracy and authoritarian government. So you think about what's going on in Ukraine right now. The struggle actually isn't over democracy per se. Viktor Yanukovych, the president that was forced out earlier this year, was democratically elected and everybody would, would admit that. The problem was that he was the leader of a kleptocratic insider group that was basically stripping uh, Ukraine of all of its assets and allowing him to build this palatial palace uh, 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 
you know, outside of Kiev and, and slipping money outside of the country and so forth. Uh, and what I think the Euromaidan protesters wanted was they didn't want to live in such a country. They wanted to live in a modern country where the government actually pretended, or at least not just pretended, but actually uh, did serve a broader uh, public interest. And I think that's really what's at stake in the, in the struggle, I think, with Vladimir Putin right now. Well, so the three elements of modernity, in your view, are the impersonal state, impartial rule of law, and accountability in the form of democracy or, or something like that. Now, the sequence has varied. Uh, well, some countries only have one. Uh, some have three, but they acquired the three in a different order. So just, just to make it a bit more concrete, mm -hmm. uh, for example, you write in the book that Germany and France mm -hmm. had law first, then the state, then democracy, uh, the US, and I, I think you say the UK as well, uh, or at least the US had democracy first and the state came later. That's right. So the, the sequence by which you adopt these different sets of institutions is actually very important for the successful functioning of them. Uh, as a person that believes normatively very strongly in the value of democracy, the conclusion that I come to in the first part of the book is actually very discouraging because it says that democracy very often actually injures the quality of the state and, and, and state administration. Uh, and I think the clearest example of this uh, is actually the United States where uh, the U.S. was actually one of the first countries to democratize. In the 1820s, most states began to eliminate the property requirements for the franchise and, and introduced uh, universal white male uh, voting. And in response to the need to get masses of voters to the polls, uh, after the 1828 election that brought Andrew Jackson to power, the first populist uh, president in the United States, you know, uh, we created this thing called the spoil system or the patronage system. Andrew Jackson won the election against John Quincy Adams. He said um, two things. First, I won the election, so I should get to decide who runs the U.S. government. And second, basically any fool can be a government official because it doesn't take that much talent to, you know, to be a government official. Uh, and this is the start of a period of uh, about 100 years in American history where virtually every office from the federal government all the way down to municipal government was, uh, was what a political scientist would today call clientelistic. It was based on uh, trading uh, political support for a job in the post office or in the police department or uh, something of that sort. And um, because the democracy happened before the consolidation of a modern impersonal state, uh, the United States failed to develop this kind of government until very, very late. Something similar happened in Greece, actually. One of the reasons that the Greeks got into such trouble during the Euro crisis was that uh, they had a very weak state. It was very illegitimate because they were a, an Ottoman province un until uh, independence in the 1820s. Uh, they were manipulated by foreigners. Uh, the failure to pay taxes, tax avoidance, uh, is a tradition in Greece that runs all the way back to Ottoman times. So it's, it's very deeply uh, embedded. And they actually opened the franchise. They were one of the first uh, European countries to open the franchise. And when people started voting in Greece in the 1860s, they went through the same logic, where to get people to vote, uh, you'd give out jobs in the public sector. And this continued after the colonels and the period of dictatorship in 1974 when Greece returned to democracy, we on the outside all celebrated the fact that, that the colonels had, had been replaced by a uh, competitive party government. But these two parties spent all of their time stuffing the public sector with their own political supporters, with the result that Greece by the 2000s had several times the per capita number of civil servants that Britain or Germany did. And that was you know, one of the causes of their inability to control their uh, deficits that then directly contributed to the Euro crisis. Well, I was pleased to see in the book that you allude to uh, Vilfredo Pareto in Gaetano Mosca uh, and others. These were the, the so-called elitist school, uh, which was particularly influenced by the post-1870 history of unified Italy, which seems to have been really one of the most corrupt countries, at least one of the most corrupt countries that had brilliant intellectuals analyzing it. <laughs> So some of these economists of Gelletti in Italy in the late 18th, early, uh, late 19th, early 20th century came up with a theory of fiscal illusion, 
dozens of ways by which politicians can trick people into thinking they're not actually being taxed or they're receiving benefits when they're actually not receiving benefits. And, and uh, the conservative scholar James Buchanan revived this in, in the 1960s. So, so there's actually political decay tends not to get as much attention among political scientists no, that's as, right. as a political order. And uh, the, uh, and the <laughs> Italians, uh, the, you know, the Christian Democrats after uh, 1946 basically created this unbelievable clientelistic system in the south of Italy because, again, they faced the same problem. How do you get relatively poor and uneducated voters to the polls? And this is what started the whole post-war Italian system of patronage and corruption uh, that you know, unfortunately uh, persists to the present moment. Um, well, tell us a little bit about how in the U.S. and maybe the U.K. too, there was a pushback against this. Well, that's actually uh, the story that I think is most relevant for countries like India or Brazil or Mexico. So um, the, the American story is important for these developing countries because I think it shows that this kind of patronage and corruption in the political system is not it's not an aberrant behavior that somehow characterizes these benighted developing countries that just don't understand what clean government is. I think it's actually a feature of early democracy. And I think the history of the United States uh, indicates that that's, uh, that's the case. But it also suggests a way out. Uh, because what happened in the United States and in Britain in the 19th century is that with economic development, you had a rising middle class. And a lot of the middle class did not have an interest in this highly corrupt uh, patronage system. And there was grassroots mobilization. So in the late 19th century in the United States, all these grandmothers would get really, really upset that their fourth class local postmaster was a patronage appointee, some incompetent political hack that had been put there by a machine politician. Uh, and they began to mobilize and petition and write letters to the editor. And then you had some great um, leadership, people like Gifford Pinchot, uh, the founder of the U.S. Forest Service, or Theodore Roosevelt, who was actually one of the early first um, uh, leaders of the uh, uh, Civil Service Commission. Uh, and then you also had uh, accident uh, play an important role. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten civil service reform in the United States but for the assassination of James A. Garfield. Garfield was elected in 1882. He was shot by a fellow named uh, Charles Guiteau, who thought he should have been the US consul to France and was really disappointed that Garfield hadn't appointed him. So he assassinates the president. Uh, Garfield takes about six weeks to die very painfully. They, they think actually his doctors made him worse rather than better uh, at the time. And at this point, Congress, which benefited from the patronage system, I mean, all the members of Congress got their offices because of their ability to dispense patronage. So they had no interest in, in reforming the system. Uh, they were, because of this external shock, embarrassed enough that they passed something called the Pendleton Act, which in 1883 established the first uh, Civil Service Commission, and then the principle that uh, people ought to be hired on the basis of merit and qualifications rather than on the basis of their political connections. And this, I think, is the route out for a country like Brazil. You know, you, you see these, the uprising in Brazil last year, they're led by better educated middle class young people by and large who are just sick and tired of the pervasive corruption and poor quality of services in, uh, you know, in Sao Paulo and Rio and other cities. Uh, and if Brazil is ever going to fix this problem, it's got to be by that same route that the United States took. It, it's a political problem at base and it can only be solved through politics. And, you know, the United States indicates that, that democracy is actually capable of correcting uh, some of its own mistakes. Well, as you write in the book, uh, the U.S. solves that civil service patronage problem uh, to a degree. <coughs> but it continues to have a very bizarre state structure, uh, which is uh, what, what Stephen Skavronik calls a state of courts and parties, uh, or of the legislature and of uh, courts and, and lawyers rather than administrators. That's right. So, um, you know, Americans are used to thinking of their system as the exemplar of a, of a modern democracy, but it's actually uh, a strange system in certain respects. The founding fathers uh, were deeply imbued with, with the need to uh, constrain government. 
the American Republic was born in a revolution against the British monarchy. Uh, and the, you know, the main um, uh, theme, I think, in American political culture ever since then has been deep, deep distrust of centralized government power and then an institutional uh, setup that limited government power. So the Constitution has many, many checks and balances, many more than in, in most European or Japanese or uh, uh, parliamentary systems, uh, meaning that power is divided and separated in, in a whole bunch of ways. So you have a very powerful upper house of the legislature, you have a separately elected uh, president, you have a court, a Supreme Court that can invalidate uh, legislation, you have delegation of duties and responsibilities to state and local government. Every single one of these um, uh, acts as a, as a potential veto point against uh, concerted action by, uh, by the government. Uh, and then, as, as uh, Michael was suggesting, uh, we have never, because we distrust executive power, we've always tended to do things through courts and legislatures where a parliamentary democracy would, would do things through, a, through a, um, uh, a, 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 an executive uh, administrative agency. So, for example, enforcement of the laws in a European democracy, this is done by the Justice Ministry or the Interior Ministry co controlling uh, a national police force. In the United States, we actually uh, uh, delegate this to private citizens. So in the 1970s, when there's a big burst of uh, social legislation in environment, occupational safety and health, equal opportun uh, employment opportunities, so forth, uh, Congress saw fit to expand the standing, meaning the right to sue the government, uh, to include you know, uh, people who in many cases actually weren't even being affected by the particular law uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in question, with the result that, uh, and in fact in California we even have a stronger version of, there's a, there's a, a, a private enforcement act that, that allows uh, citizens to sue the government very easily. And this uh, is you know, government by courts. I mean, a European would think that this is very bizarre because it's up to the government to enforce its own uh, rules, but here we have a private attorney general, you know, basically private attorney generals. and so. I think it leads to very high transaction costs. You cannot put in a big infrastructure project uh, in the United States without going through the courts for a couple of decades. There's a case uh, in Oakland uh, near where I live these days where they wanted to deepen Oakland Harbor because they had a new generation of container ships coming in. This was in the mid-1970s. And so the Corps of Eng Army Corps of Engineers did a plan Immediately, it was challenged in the courts by all of these private attorney generals, including you know, a group of fishermen that had a fishery like 200 miles down the coast that they thought would somehow be affected by, uh, by this dredging plan. And the result was that the harbor doesn't get uh, dredged and expanded until sometime in the early 1990s. The port of Rotterdam, by contrast, had the same problem in the late 1970s, and they did it within a, like a five-year period because uh, they've just got a more efficient uh, you know, type of government. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, a point worth expanding on briefly uh, because I think both progressives and conservatives get the history wrong when they say that business rebelled against the New Deal and the progressive era regulations uh, and, and then that explains a lot of late 20th century history. In fact, big business was pretty much reconciled to the regulatory utility framework that developed in the progressive era and the New Deal because you had industry by industry regulation, right? The railroads mm -hmm. and trucking and public and electrical utilities. And the regulators wanted the industries to be healthy. You know, mm -hmm. They didn't want them to gouge, you know, use monopoly, uh, uh, predatory monopolies and gouge consumers. What happened inspired by Ralph Nader and a lot of the public interest movement, as you've said, in the 60s and 70s, you got what was called the new regulation, where it was these broad, economy-wide things, mm -hmm. right? Environmentalism, consumerism, dis handicapped access, which is fine. I mean, you know, this th represented the next step in the quality of life. But because of these private attorney general statutes, which are really bizarre, uh, what it means is that the, they, uh, you have to have standing in order to sue in court, right? Traditionally, unless you were personally affected, you did not have standing. Uh, under these private attorney general statutes, uh, I could have no interest whatsoever 
in whether this thing yeah. is dredged or not. But nevertheless, I could sue, right, right, in right. court, and and arguably this created a lot of the hostility of the business community yeah. to regulation, which simply did not exist in the Eisenhower era or, or even the Roosevelt era. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Then the other side of the courts and parties government uh, is the parties. Um, and I think there uh, you see basically a return of a certain kind of patrimonialism. So the progressive era got rid of the kind of overt bribery uh, and gift you know, exchange uh, that existed in the 19th century. But we define you know, bribery extremely narrowly. It has to be a, a quid pro quo that, you know, where there's a clear connection that the prosecutors can prove. What we have seen you know, appear is not that kind of bribery. There's not that much overt bribery of congressmen of the 19th century sort. What you see is basically ritualized gift giving uh, or, or reciprocal uh, gift exchange where a lobbyist makes a donation, doesn't expect anything immediately in return, and then it just so happens six months later the, you know, the, the member of Congress votes uh, in a way that the lobbyist, you know, makes the lobbyist very happy. And there's no quid pro quo. The system is perfectly, um, uh, is perfectly uh, uh, legal. Uh, now, of course, a democracy is supposed to have interest groups. I mean, no one would argue that you shouldn't have interest groups. But I think that we've gotten to a point where uh, there is a real problem in representation because well-organized, well-resourced interest groups using this check and balance system can protect their interests in a way that does not represent the interest of you know, the public as a whole. I think the best example of this is just the tax code. The US tax code, uh, you know, everybody looking at this thinks it's a co total disgrace. It's way, way too long and detailed. Uh, everybody knows that the uh, corporate marginal tax rate is high. It's one of the highest in the developed world, it's like 35%. Uh, but very few corporations actually pay this because they've all negotiated special exemptions for themselves. There's a story a couple of years ago that G GE managed to pay no corporate taxes whatsoever. Uh, and all the tax experts say, well, look, you ought to lower the marginal tax rate and then just get rid of these special uh, exemptions and subsidies and privileges. But you can't do it, even though everybody intellectually says, yes, this would be a much more rational system. And you can't do it because of the nature of what I call our vetocracy, uh, meaning rule by veto, uh, that the system privileges well-organized minorities in a way that a parliamentary system would not, that then makes it impossible to reform, uh, uh, reform our tax system. So now we know who rules America, the veto. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's very provocative. Why don't we uh, get some questions now and uh, have a conversation? OK. Yes, right here. Uh, do we have a microphones? Microphones coming. Uh, hi, how are you? Uh, Miriam Hassan. Uh, I find your argument very interesting. There's always been this issue of the what is first, the chicken and the, or the egg, if it is democracy or the state or the rule of law. And I, I've never, you know, understood which one is really really goes first because you could argue that the U.S. had first democracy, then a stronger state, and th then came the rule of law. Or I mean, what is the order? Mm -hmm. I come from Mexico. There was for a while the argument that it was first having, you know, the state, uh, then uh, you know the rule of law in theory. <laughs> and then democracy, and now we have democracy, we don't have the rule of law, and we don't know what kind of state we have. You have bureaucratic authoritarian systems in uh, South America, yeah. where they try to build you know, stronger states. You, you seem to argue that um, having meritocracy, meritocratic systems is one of the main uh, variables. What would be the driving variables, or, mm -hmm. the, or the independent variables, right. in defining what goes first, and what would be the right components, and what would be the elements that would bring this stable systems that would bring, you know, s stable countries like advanced democracies. Yeah. So there's a couple of definitional points that are really important. So when I use, I sometimes use the, the, the term strong state a little bit carelessly. Uh, by that, I do not mean a repressive state that's able to jail journalists and, you know, get rid of opposition politicians. What I mean is a state that has the capacity to actually deliver basic public goods, education, uh, health and to do it in a in an impersonal way, 
And that's the part that Mexico has had a real problem with. I mean, it does not have an impersonal state. I mean, clientelism in Mexico is still pervasive. And so, you know, the two parties or the three parties compete with each other. When they get into power in a city or a state, you know, they deliver social services to their clients and, and you know, not in an impersonal uh, sense. And um, it's that struggle. So the democracy part in Mexico, I think, is pretty well established uh, now that you've had this alternation of parties and you know pretty open media and so forth uh, now the real struggle is actually to build not just a state that's repressive but a state that is actually modern and and, and impersonal uh, and that I think is what requires this general mobilization because you can only you know succeed in doing this uh, the question of sequencing and what should come first um, you know that's been an academic debate my um, mentor Samuel Huntington invented this idea of the authoritarian transition. He said, you know, you, you have to have state power first and you have to have basic order and then you can think about democracy as you get richer uh, and so forth. I actually don't agree with that. I think that there are countries where that happened, like South Korea or Taiwan, uh, and if, if that was the sequence that unfolded and it worked, that's fine. But most countries don't have that option. You know, most countries actually face tremendous pressure from their own populations to democratize. And so there's no Olympian point from which somebody, uh, much less an outsider, can say, oh, no, no, you should wait for democracy another 20, 30 years until you're ready for it, and only then can you have political participation. That, that's just not the way the world works. And so I think, for better or worse, we are forced in m many countries to build all of these institutions simultaneously. My only point is that I think that, well, okay, this is a generalization I could make for, for Latin America, that you know, we've put a lot of effort into the democratic, the building the democratic institutions over the past uh, couple of generations. And I think in most countries that's been a, a gain that we've made. And now the agenda's shifted. It's, it's really towards getting to this modern state that, that should really take priority. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Um, hypothetically, you leave this place, and President Obama calls your cell, and he said, you have a big book there, and I don't have time to read it all. But I, I'm really impressed with your ideas. Could you give me two or three really good ideas that would help America that you found as you were writing, researching, et cetera? Well, um, See, that's a hard question to answer. I didn't write this as a policy book, even though I, you know, I've been in public policy institutions my whole career. Uh, I really read, wrote it more as an analytical thing. And as I argue in the chapters on the United States, I think that many of our problems are so deeply embedded in our constitutional order that there's actually not that much you can do about them. So I've now really concluded <laughs> that uh, parliamentary systems just tend to work better than presidential ones. Uh, the presidential ones either end up deadlocked like we are right now, or they end up like a lot of ones in Latin America, where because of the deadlock you then delegate huge powers to the president, and that's not a good solution uh, either. Uh, I think that institutionally there are a number of modest things that you could do uh, that would make things better, and basically most of them have to do with inserting more hierarchy uh, and reducing the number of veto points in the, in the American system. So, for example, senatorial holds are just absurd. You know, there's like 60 ambassador appointments that are now held up in the Senate because every individual senator can put an anonymous hold on any given appointment. I mean, imagine if you tried to run Google where every member of the board could actually stop a mid-level employment decision on the part of the, the management. It's, it's crazy. You can't run an organization like the filibuster is another one that's not in the Constitution. It's just a, it's just a Senate rule. And I think in dealing with the budget, ultimate, you know, so the the vetocracy part is going to be uh, a real uh, obstacle to entitlement reform. So conservatives tend to like a lot of checks and balances because they say, well, that's what's protected us from strong and overweening government. But the problem is now you've got a very large government, and if you want to reform it, you actually have to have a strong government. I mean, you have to have a government that can actually decide that we're going to raise taxes, control spending, 
it's going to hurt the interest of a lot of very powerful uh, interest groups. And so it's got to be, it's got to be fairly uh, decisive. And so I think ultimately that you could try to embed a more parliamentary type procedure in our existing system that's kind of, you know, we had versions of this like with the base closing commission a few years ago where no congressman wants um, a base closed in their district. So they turn this over to an impartial nonpartisan committee that simply decided on which bases to close and then put the whole thing up to Congress in a single up or down uh, yes or no vote. They do this with trade promotion authority and other things as well, where if you just let the individual interests, well-organized interests decide, you'll never get, get anywhere. And you know you may end up doing something, have to do something like this ultimately with, with entitlement reform, because currently under our institutional rules, I just don't see how you're going to get there. Yes, right here. I am Ari Ratner. I'm a fellow at New America, and I'm writing a book on bureaucracy or bureaucratic reform. Uh, and it, it's interesting what you just said because obviously in Congress the problem is to some degree lack of hierarchy. Um, you know, you end up with what you describe as a autocracy. Uh, in the executive branch, you know, real problem is lack of discretion. Obviously, to the yeah. individual agencies, but also, you know, at the level of employees. You know, with the exception of yes. you know teachers in the classroom, soldiers in the field. You know, everyone else has no discretion which you end up with no accountability and no managerial discretion either. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just stating things, but I'd, I'm curious to hear your reaction. What, uh, how states other than us have thought through that problem yes. and are reforming that problem? Well, so you're a great customer for my book because <laughs> actually the whole question of bureaucratic autonomy, I think, is central to effective government. So. There's no question that a bureaucracy has to be under the control of the democratic principles. They're just agents that have to be controlled by the democratic principles. So there's no question that, that who's the boss in that system. But given that, there has to be a delegation of sufficient authority so that you know, the agents can actually make appropriate decisions and use judgment and incorporate local knowledge and so forth. And here, I think, our general distrust of government has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, we don't trust uh, the government to make decisions uh, appropriately, and therefore you encumber them with all sorts of detailed rules. So why does the Air Force buy $600 toilet seats? It's because you've got this thing called the Federal Acquisitions Regulation that runs to several thousand pages detailing all of the rules by which it is necessary for a federal agency to procure you know, something or employment. You know, I mean, there's, there's many domains in which is, uh, this is the case. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's a general characterization that, that there's not nearly enough discretion. But this is where the presidential system really gets in the way. So in a parliamentary system, you could say, OK, there's not enough discretion. We're going to adjust the boundary of administrative discretion by giving them more powers. And because the same party controls the legislature and controls the executive, that's not problematic. But can you imagine if you went to John Boehner today and said, well, our proposal is to give more discretion to the executive agencies controlled by President Obama. What's he going to say? You know, great. You know, that's just what we want. Uh, and that's where I think presidentialism really is, you know, is, a, uh, is a problem. Um, I guess one further thing I would add is that it's not a, it's not a uniformly bleak picture because, in fact, uh, Congress sees fit to delegate substantial autonomy to certain selected agencies. So the Federal Reserve is you know, an incredible case of that. But also the military, not in procurement and routine operations, but in actual military operations. They're given a lot of authority to do what they want. Um, you know, the Centers for Disease Control or NASA, you know, these agencies are given you know, a fair amount of latitude. Uh, and it's interesting, I think it's very revealing about how Americans think about their government. If you look at different polls of trust in government, the agencies that tend to be the most trusted by uh, Americans tend to be the most expert ones that are the least subject to this kind of detailed democratic oversight. Uh, so the courts and the army and you know NASA and so forth. What is the least trusted part of the American government? it is the one that is the most subject to immediate democratic control, which is basically the House of Representatives. Uh, and so it's as if Americans kind of recognize that they can't trust themselves, you know, that, that uh, 
the things that are subject to the most populist uh, direct control are actually the least effective parts of the government. Uh, but no one's actually, you know, so try getting up, you know, in, a, in an election campaign and saying, well, I actually think that I, as your elected representative, should have less authority and we should give more authority <laughs> to bureaucrats. I mean, who's going to get elected on that kind of a platform? Yes, front row. Thank you, and thank you for a very informative talk. I'm Alan Sessom from the, at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and I spent time in the State Department. I was wondering what your view uh, of the implementation of foreign policy is under, in a presidential system or in a parliamentary system, because from what I can see and from the experience I had, neither of them work particularly well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's a complicated question. Uh, I think that anybody that has had any experience in American foreign policy knows that, you know, like 99% of your time is, is consumed in interagency battles. Uh, and the other 1% is spent actually thinking about the outside world and how to deal with foreign countries and, uh, and this sort of thing. And, um, you know, there have been many attempts to solve this question, the creation of the National Security Council and the whole you know, White House structure in the 1948, the big reorganization that also created the Defense Department and so forth. That was an attempt uh, to solve it. But there is kind of a natural law of bureaucracy that you know, the, 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 these agencies sort of multiply and then they kind of replicate each other. So you know, it's been interesting to watch the growth of the NSC over the last 40 years because it used to be a very small body that was only responsible for interagency coordination. And now, basically, it's its own State Department. You know, they replicate all the offices in the State Department. Meanwhile, the State Department, in order to keep up, has started to replicate its offices and, uh, and so forth. And so, um, you know, if you don't have a highly engaged president that is able to delegate uh, appropriately, but also keeps an eye on all of this stuff, uh, then this interagency process just leads to, you know, to garbage, I mean, as, a, as an output. Uh, in a parliamentary system, you know, it, it's, it's, it kind of depends on, on, you know, exactly how they're set up. I'm kind of impressed with smaller countries like Australia and Canada that have actually set up pretty effective whole of government, you know, efforts to try to coordinate this stuff a little bit uh, better. But I suspect that that probably has to do with their size. And if you tried to do something like that in Washington, it, it just wouldn't work because of, you know, the big entrenched interests that exist already. Well, there's some political science literature that shows that the fragmentation of our system between the executive and a bicameral legislature in the courts leads to multiple interest groups. That's so, right. for example, in your, your traditional parliamentary democracy, there will be one employer's association, you know, one industrial union, in the United States, you, there are two teachers unions, right? That's right. There are multiple trade associations, yeah. and it means that if you win with the White House but lose in the, in the Congress, then a rival organization can then focus on Congress. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, in, a, in, a, in Germany or, or Britain, uh, in their parliamentary systems, it actually makes no sense for a lobbyist to go lobby an individual member mm -hmm. of parliament because they have no, they don't make the budget, you know, they have no impact on you know, on, on spending, uh, you have to go to the top of the party organization. Uh, whereas in our country, you've got multiple entry points. And so, you know, there are all the different committees and individual members of Congress uh, and so forth. So that's, uh, that's absolutely uh, correct. The only thing I would say is that the EU is becoming more, the EU as a whole is becoming a lot more like the United States in ways that are not good. Uh, so now if you can't get your way at a member state level, mm -hmm. you can go to Brussels and you know try to lobby uh, there, and so you're they're developing a federal system like ours that is equally you know open to access by by you know by different groups. They want to be the United States of Europe in the worst way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, towards the back. Hi, Lee Drutman. I'm a fellow here. Um, so I. I I'm Sort of wondering whether I mean you've talked about some of these these problems being sort of endemic into the, uh, as endemic to the U.S. system in the way we we uh, separate power and, and just you know all the all the veto points. But 
Uh, part of me thinks that actually there was a period of time when, when actually we, we, we did a lot of things in, in mm -hmm. the 60s and the 70s, and we passed a lot of laws, and we actually solved a bunch of problems, and then something happened. Yes. Um, and so is it a bunch of, of things that were, were set in motion by the passage of all those laws, by all that activity? And, and if so, is, I mean, you, you leave us with a very pessimistic view mm -hmm. of, of what we might do other than scrap the entire system or, <laughs> or maybe have a, a global war yeah. or something. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, is, if so, I mean, did, did we hit this critical moment when everything kind of got messed up and now we're, are we kind of in, in the gray goose no, that's situation yeah. of, of politics? No, that's, a, that's a very good question. I should have addressed that point earlier. So it is true that the system has been evolving so that veto points have been multiplying like the use of the filibuster, just, you know, we use it much, much more than we did 50 years ago. But that's not, this, that's not what's causing the current problem. The, the current problem has to do with polarization, or it's when polarization meets this vetocratic system. So for most of the 20th century, the two parties had very, very substantial overlap. And all of the big legislative, you know, achievements of, you know, FDR and Reagan and so forth were the result of you know, the president being able to get substantial support from the other party. But since the 19, late 1980s, you know, the two parties have pulled apart completely. Um, this is something, you know, a guy like Evan Poole, political scientist at Georgia, I mean, he has this DW nominate, you know, metric that is actually very good at showing this. And, and the, you know, the parties have pulled apart, so the most liberal Republican is now a lot more conservative than the most conservative Democrat. <coughs> in a parliamentary system, this wouldn't be a big issue. And in fact, parliamentary parties are usually pretty ideological and, and you know, opposed like this. But in our system, it's a disaster because it means that now the two parties in their ideological competition will use every lever that our system gives them. And our system gives them lots of levers. Uh, you know. So a lot of these ambassadorial appointments uh, or executive branch appointments are not being held up because they've got a real worry about the competence of the, you know, the appointee. It's just part of the partisan, you know, part of the partisan struggle. So I think it's, it's, it's the institutional rules meeting up with the current degree of polarization in the system that's really causing the problem. Well, I'm not sure this, this was a case of accident or murder <laughs> in, in the sense that you could argue that the American people are not divided into these two parties. Uh, and most uh, list brokers and the political uh, advertisers and pollsters, they come up with different categories of three different groups or eight groups or something. And we essentially had a multi-party system. Because of our electoral rules, you end up with two omnibus parties. But under that, you had the Southern Democrats who were yeah. to the right of the Northern Republicans and so on. It is actually uh, Newt Gingrich, a lot of people give him credit or blame in the 1990s for trying to impose this kind of Westminster British type parliamentary uh, centralization. Uh, uh, Tom DeLay told an acquaintance of mine who was a liberal Republican not to run from upstate New York because it would blur the message, right? Which, it, which is a, a sort of a modern idea, right? That you would rather yeah. be pure than, than be this kind of omnibus coalition. Well, yeah, so it's, it's... So there are social trends, but there's also, this was a deliberate strategic decision yeah. by some elites to well, have a more so polarized system. So there's, there's a controversy among the social scientists as to whether the degree of polarization in the society itself. Uh, I have a colleague at Stanford, uh, Morris Fiorina, that's written several books saying that actually American society isn't all that polarized, and the polarization is really just within the political class, and then other people just you know, they, they think that that's not true, that, for example, in, in resident, you know, that Americans are segregating themselves residentially by, you know, where they choose to live. Uh, and so there is some, uh, some societal polarization. Uh, a lot of it, so it's complicated, though, because it's, there's more ideological purity being asked of the two parties. But actually, the degree to which the party leadership can affect uh, their parties is, has weakened substantially, and especially with the latest couple of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, what's driving the Republican Party to the right is not the central party leadership. It's these outside you know, forces, all the Shel right. Sheldon Adelsons and Koch's and so forth, that have so much money or so much more money 
than the party itself does. And I think actually if you returned control uh, of finance to the, the party apparatus itself, you'd actually get much more you know, moderate candidates. Um. Well, that, but that's one of the, the counterintuitive, counterproductive reforms, arguably, yeah. has been all the reforms have tried to weaken in, and demonize the party control of money. So the mm -hmm. party can't raise enormous amount of money and then target a few swing races. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, <coughs> you're, you're trying to make each candidate self-funded. That's right. And th candidates just have less bargaining uh, leverage with special interest than a, a single party could say, okay, you know, <coughs> we're, we're not going to do what you want. Right. We don't need, we need your money. Right. Yes, right here. Yeah. Um, your book doesn't really spend much time on, on the courts. I mean, you mentioned private uh, uh, attorney generals. You, and you, your book talks about the Supreme Court's role in, in fighting regulation. Uh, it seems to me, though, that the courts are actually quite the definitive uh, decision maker as yesterday in not accepting the marriage equality or in campaign finance in allowing all types of uh, contributions. And uh, so I, I was wondering really as to what you see in a role of a court in, in a system like ours. And the second, the second sort of comment is, and I'd like to hear your response, that our s when we have uh, a pre in today's Washington Post, uh, Philip Bump's uh, The Fix, about uh, having a, that a Republican Senate, that is uh, a Congress controlled by the, uh, by the other party, will actually lead to some progress and uh, less polarization in the country? Well, I think in general, you know, the rule of law is something that's very basic uh, to the United States and one of its great virtues. <laughs> But I think in many cases, we just have too much law. Uh, and you know, so the case I gave you is uh, of uh, substituting uh, you know, private lawsuits for administrative enforcement is, is a kind of classic uh, case of this, that we would, you know, things would be done much, much more efficiently if, if we proceeded in a, you know, a very different, uh, in a very different manner. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, um, it would be nice if you could have these definitive decisions by the courts on certain key issues. And in fact, a lot of times Congress does this. They don't actually want to decide on, on abortion or you know, other naughty issues. So they kind of throw it into the lap of the courts and hope that they'll bear the brunt of whatever decision comes out. But the trouble is that then that leads to the politicization of the courts itself. And that's something that's very you know, unfortunate. So even if you look at that recent you know, yesterday's, whenever it was the abortion decision, you know, justices, um, no, I'm sorry, it's, it wasn't that. It was a, it was a decision about... Um, not, not taking uh, the cases on marriage equality. I'm sorry, the, mar the marriage equality decision, yeah. the Supreme Court's decision not to accept the uh, appellate court cases because they all right. were... Yeah, no, I'm sorry, well, it wasn't that one, but an increasing number of cases are actually being decided, you know, on partisan lines by you know the party. You know the party appointed justices, uh, and so you know there's been this creeping politicization of the courts, which uh, you know is also not. So the courts just become another avenue well, for political contestation. Well, you, you have law professors. I've been told will publish law review articles aimed at a single member of of the court, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of targeting that yeah. individual, right. <laughs> Uh, more questions? Right here. And then we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, while it may seem that uh, there's a lot of gridlock, a lot of stuff is actually happening. I'm talking about the transition in attitudes uh, uh, leading to change in law on gay rights and so on. I'm talking about a fundamental reform of the health care system and so on. And while things may not be happening at the federal level, there's a lot of experimentation in the 50 states and territories, which eventually leads to yeah. changes. So in a sense, it uh, is a fulfillment of uh, Churchill's quip about America always doing the right thing after it's tried everything else. Uh, if you move somewhat slowly and with some amount of creative disorder, maybe you have a better chance of getting it right ultimately. No, there's, uh, there's something to be said for that. If you have a very decisive parliamentary system, uh, 
you know, you can do all these big flip-flops in policy where one government comes in, they change everything, and then the next government undoes it, you know, uh, the next time. And the American system was designed to, you know, slow all of that down. And you're right that uh, a lot of the most creative government is actually, an effective government is actually happening uh, at a state and, and municipal level. Uh, I just think that there are a certain category of decisions that, you know, just given globalization and the nature of the modern economy have to be made, you know, nationally. And healthcare is one of them. Uh, you know, the, the healthcare system, you know, if you want mobility within, you know, labor mobility within the country, if every state's got incredibly different laws for the portability of health insurance, uh, or it's all linked to employers, it's going to decrease, you know, labor mobility. And so this is something that most European countries, Japan, Australia, I mean, everybody figured this out, you know, uh, 70, 80 years ago. And the United States is just getting to this uh, right now. And yes, we are going to, I think, you know, I, I think that the Affordable Care Act is not going to be repealed. Ultimately, it's going to be reformed, but the process is so slow and it is so inefficient. Um, you know, what ought to have happened is they passed the ACA. They realize immediately that there's a lot of things wrong with it. They didn't get the incentive systems right, so they go back and they fix it. But instead, we've been caught up for the last, you know, two, three years on a debate about whether we should just repeal the whole thing, you know, from the get-go. And so, so yes, maybe we'll get to the right point <laughs> eventually, but, uh, you know, it's, it, we could just do a lot better than we're doing. Um, last question. Hi, uh, it's very interesting. I'm a Norwegian journalist, and I, I just want to follow up on one of the first questions here about uh, democracy and state. The English scholar Paul Collier, he says that uh, democracy has been prematurely introduced into countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, and rather encouraging a, um, a split along tribal and clan lines instead of uh, uh, making it possible to create a strong nation or a state. What is your opinion on that? Well, I just think that those arguments for sequencing don't take account of political realities. So let's take the case of Iraq, where a number of people, not just Paul Collier, have suggested that we had elections too early after the occupation. But the problem was that at the moment of the occupation, after you got rid of Saddam Hussein, there are no legitimate political actors whatsoever. Uh, and without legitimate political actors, you, you know, you couldn't even start to rebuild uh, the society. And that's why Ayatollah Sistani, who I think is actually one of the wisest, you know, political figures in Iraq, was pushing for early elections because he said, look, you have to have some basis of legitimacy and this is the only way you're going to get to it. So there is no standpoint from which the United States could have said, oh, we'll just run Iraq out of our embassy in Baghdad for the next 10 years until you Iraqis are mature enough to elect a government. That it just was politically a non-starter. So yeah, theoretically, maybe there would have been some virtue to that. I mean, in some cases like Bosnia, you probably could have delayed the elections you know, by a year or two. But in the end, I think that's not a realistic choice for most, uh, most countries. The book is Political Order and Political Decay. The author is uh, Francis Fukuyama. Please uh, join me in thanking him. Thank you.